Actor Tyrone Power was a popular leading man in Hollywood during the 1930s and 40s. He came from a long line of actors, many of whom shared the same name. A distant ancestor of his was the Irish actor William Grattan Tyrone Power, also known as just Tyrone Power. This actor was, in 1841, involved in a great and mysterious tragedy at sea. In early to mid-March of 1841, there was a tremendous storm in the North Atlantic. By March the 12th, the winds and rain had reached England. That night, the rains fell heavily on the capital. In the Blackheath area of London was the home of Benjamin Webster, the leaseholder of the Haymarket Theatre and a close friend of Tyrone Power. As Webster slept, his butler was awoken by the storm. As he paced the halls late into the night, he heard a voice crying out. It was coming from outside, a voice he knew all too well. There was no doubt in his mind that it was that of his employer's good friend, Tyrone Power. He was calling out to Benjamin Webster to let him in. When Webster was awoken by the butler and called down to investigate, there was no one outside. Benjamin Webster, annoyed by the intrusion and being woken at such a late hour, chastised his butler for being fooled by the sounds of the storm. However, his butler disagreed that he had simply been fooled. He was sure of what he'd heard. Webster explained that it couldn't have possibly been his good friend anyway, because he was on tour in the United States. Webster went back to bed and thought little more of it. Benjamin Webster, however, was partially correct. Tyrone Power had been in America, but his tour had recently come to an end, and he was, at that very moment, on his way back to England on board the SS President. The passenger liner had left New York for Liverpool on only its third ever eastbound transatlantic voyage on the 11th of March. There were concerns regarding the SS President. In fact, following her last voyage from England to the US, she had to undergo considerable repairs after her hull had been damaged. She was also said to be top-heavy and rolled excessively in high winds. For this journey, she was intentionally overloaded with cargo to compensate for her roll. Whatever happened to the SS President after she sailed out of New York that day is still not known, and her mysterious disappearance was major news for several months. When she failed to arrive in Liverpool, there was little concern at first. In those days, it was common for a steamer to be days late to port. What's more, the President was known to be one of the slower vessels at sea. There were several reported sightings of the SS President in various locations, one ship's captain claimed to see her off the coast of Ireland, while two other sightings put her in the western part of the North Atlantic, between Massachusetts and Nova Scotia. This colour print is a depiction of one of those sightings. According to the caption below, the President was seen at 3pm from a ship named Orpheus. Part of the caption reads, In the inquiry before the British Consul on June 5th, 1841, Captain Cole of the packet ship Orpheus stated that when he last saw the President, she was rising on top of a tremendous sea, pitching heavily and labouring tremendously. She was situated in that dangerous part of the Atlantic Ocean, about midway between the Nantucket Shoal and St George's Bank, just where the Gulf Stream strikes soundings, and where the waves rise straight up and down as high as a four- or five-storey house. It was his belief that the President did not survive the gale, but foundered with all on board, and that all perished before sundown on the 13th, or in less than 24 hours after he last saw her, most probably on the terrible night of March 12, 1841. In the coming weeks following the President's disappearance, Tyrone Power's wife received a letter, presumably from the actor, stating that he and all the passengers were safe, and that the ship was undergoing repairs in Portugal. This letter was found to be a cruel hoax. A bottle was later found on the Irish coast, with a note inside which read, The President is sinking, may God help us, Tyrone Power. This too was a hoax. The SS President was never found, and all on board her were never heard from again. This brings us back to London and the great storm of the 12th of March 1841. I have told stories of astral projection before, where a dead or dying person appears to a family member or a close friend moments before or after their death. Could Tyrone Power have tried to make himself known to his friend Benjamin Webster by appearing at his door as the SS President went down on the 12th of March, taking all 139 passengers and crew with her? Benjamin Webster, after learning of the ship's disappearance, certainly believed that he had.
on Saturday the 5th of November 1994, the Aberdeen Evening Express printed an account of an alleged haunting on the North Sea oil rig the Ninian South platform, which is around 80 miles east of the Shetland Islands. The witness was a Glaswegian contract painter named Bill McCluskey. It was the summer of 1990 when McCluskey was allotted a two-man cabin in the new living quarters after a previous occupier, a man from Liverpool, had chosen to change rooms. Bill McCluskey, who was in his 50s, turned in one night after a long day's work. He lay on his bunk with his feet towards the cabin door and his bed curtains open, so he had a clear view of the door. He said that he awoke in the dimly lit cabin to see a man and a woman standing close together by the door. They were in conversation, holding hands, and appeared to be worried about something, but no sound came from them. They were solid human forms, middle-aged, silver-haired, and dressed in 1920s-style clothing. Bill McCluskey said they looked as if they were dressed for a yacht. The man was wearing grey flannels, a jumper and white shoes. The woman was in a grey striped jacket, what looked like a kind of waistcoat, and white shoes. Bill said that she bore a strong resemblance to the late Wallace Simpson, Duchess of Windsor. He made no attempt to speak to them, and as far as he could see, Bill said, they were completely unaware of him. After watching them for what Bill believed to be about a minute, they just disappeared. McCluskey said, The figures were solid looking. When I first saw them, I thought it was real people who had wandered into the cabin. It didn't bother me. I fell asleep soon after. I didn't tell any of the lads the next day. They would have just laughed. It's thought by Bill and others who believe his story that the couple once occupied a yacht that went missing at sea some 70 years prior. Bill kept his silence for two years. It wasn't until radio operator Dave Moxie, based on the Ninian Central platform three miles north of the South platform, reported a mayday call on the night of the 26th of September 1992. The message could easily be made out, but it was described as distant and electronic sounding. A call was put out every half an hour asking for the caller to respond, but there was no reply. The Shetland Coast Guard and rig safety vessels searched the area for signs of a stranded or sunken vessel, but nothing was found. Bill McCluskey believed that the mystery SOS call was a ghostly distress call from the past. The strange story even made it into the oil company's own in-house publication, the Chevron Times. Shetland author and journalist Jim Nicholson, who was interviewed by the publication, said that he was keeping an open mind as to whether or not the Mayday call and Bill's experience was supernatural, but explained that many ships had sunk in the area over the past century, and in the course of one night, 16 herring boats were lost in a storm, a disaster that saw the deaths of 58 men. The origin of the strange synthesised voice was never confirmed, but one senior Coast Guard officer said that it was likely to have been broadcast in error from a piece of recording equipment offshore. But Bill McCluskey said he still thinks it could have been a voice from the past. Something else bothered Bill about the experience he'd had that summer night in 1990. Why did the man who occupied the cabin before him leave? Did he also have an eerie experience? I found the following story in 2003's Ghost Story of the Sea by Barbara Smith. The story, although not strictly a story of the sea, so forgive me for that, is nonetheless a particularly creepy one, and it raised a few questions when I came to researching it further. In her book, Smith refers to the lighthouse featured as Standard Rock, and states that it stands in Lake Superior close to Duluth, Minnesota. There is not, and as far as I can see, never was a lighthouse by that name in this location. To confuse matters further, the image of the lighthouse shown in the book is that of Minnesota Point Light, which has been no more than a ruin since the 1970s. Since the alleged events in this story took place in 1993, during a restoration of the building, it makes the story even harder to fathom. However, the 78-foot Standard Rock Lighthouse of Lake Superior which began operation in 1882, lies 28 miles southeast of Grant Township, Michigan. Considering the similarity of the name and the history of fire damage that the 2003 book describes, which Stannard Rock did suffer in 1961, it's fair to say that this could well be the lighthouse in question. That said, I'll begin. In the spring of 1993, 
several members of the Coast Guard were assigned the task of repainting and restoring part of the lighthouse. It was a man named Jeff, a Coast Guard member who recounts his experience. He described the approach to the lighthouse as calm. The team were in high spirits and there was nothing to worry about. However, as they got closer, the weather deteriorated quickly. The winds were so strong, he said, that they had to drop anchor and wait out the gales. According to Jeff, it was almost two days before they could safely land in a small boat. As soon as they did, the team wasted no time in starting the job. After a couple of hours, though, the weather turned again. Jeff and his team worked as fast and effectively as they could, but decided that in order to finish the work, they would need to wait out the worst of the weather by spending the night in the lighthouse. At one point, early that evening, Jeff and another Coast Guard member named Jerry took a break from their chores and began to discuss the fire that had occurred in the lighthouse in 1961, injuring three and killing one. Perhaps in an attempt to lighten the mood, Jerry opened the door to the stairway, which leads down to the lighthouse's lower level. The men knew that no one was down there, but Jerry jokingly shouted into the dark void, Hey, we're going to have a bite to eat. Do you want anything? The attempt at humour had the opposite effect, because as soon as those words had been spoken, loud noises could be heard coming from the lower level beyond the stairs. Scraping and knocking, but most chilling of all, the men could hear footsteps on the stairs. Jeffrey and Jerry raced up the stairs to the main level, where, in an attempt to calm their nerves, ate some food and told their story to the rest of the team, which was mostly met with laughter. Work on the lighthouse resumed until 11pm, which is when a couple of the men suggested going down to the lower level, just to, quote, see what would happen. Jeff wasn't keen, but admitted to going through with it because he didn't want to be branded a coward. So at the stroke of midnight, five of the Coast Guard team headed down the dark stairway and called out a greeting to whatever might be down there. Jeff suddenly became aware of something in that cold, dark basement. An unseen presence, maybe, he later attested, the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. I swear I could feel something moving around us. I'm sure I was not the only one either. After a few moments of experiencing this strange sensation, the team decided to make their way out of the lighthouse basement. That's when the sounds, the knocking and footsteps began again. This time there was no doubt in anyone's mind that there was something moving up the stairs. They all made a run for it, to the main level and away from the still open basement door. Jeff was the last person out of there, and he claimed that as he followed the rest of them, he took one glance back at the basement door, where he saw, quote, a shadow with no definite shape to it, emerge from the doorway. It was close to 3am when the group finished their work. This is when they moved to the upper level of the lighthouse to get some much needed sleep. It wasn't easy though, for the rest of the night, according to Jeff, they were awoken by banging on walls, footsteps and even distant moans. When the sun came up and they went back downstairs, they found that their equipment had been scattered around, and a garbage can which had been turned on its side was crushed. On June the 18th, 1961, an explosion ripped through the Stannard Rock Lighthouse. The explosion took place below the main deck of the lighthouse, where the generators and gasoline were stored. The force of the explosion sent flames shooting up the stairwells and blew a TV and refrigerator out the galley window. Out of the four men at the lighthouse, three survived. One of those was 22-year-old Walter Scobie. In 2015, on the 54th anniversary of the incident, a 76-year-old Walter travelled from Rochester, Indiana with his family to Stannard Rock for the first time since the incident. Walter detailed the events of that fateful night. He said that he was thrown from his bunk by the explosion. Unsure of the severity of the situation, he went in search for his team. Besides himself, there was 18-year-old Richard Horn, 34-year-old William Maxwell, and a Coast Guard member named Oscar Daniels, who had only joined them the day before to repair a generator. Horn and Daniels were present, but there was no sign of William Maxwell. Their obvious means of escape was a 12-foot dinghy they had kept at the lighthouse but the explosion had tossed it into the lake. After the initial panic, Richard Horn noticed it in the water, but the waves were quickly dragging it away. Jumping into the frigid Lake Superior, Horn attempted to retrieve the dinghy, but after a short while, due to the weather conditions, he gave up, turned around, 
and with the help of Walter Scobie, who threw him a life ring, was lucky to make it out alive. The fire burned for three hours and was too hot to allow the men to re-enter the lighthouse. The survivors looked out over the water and all around the outside of the lighthouse, but William Maxwell was nowhere to be found. When searching for food, they found two bottles of ketchup and one can of beans. The men managed to ration this for what turned out to be three days. The explosion also knocked out their only means of communication with the mainland. Up until that point, they had made contact with Station Marquette twice a day by radio. At night, Walter Scobie went to the top of the lighthouse and sent SOS signals through the lens using a flashlight that he had found. Finally, on the third day, the Coast Guard came to their rescue, returning the three surviving men to the mainland. This story was told to the Rotary Club in Margate, England, by one Commander Lockyer in October of 1922. Commander Lockyer related that when serving on a gunboat many years before in the Indian Ocean, his main duty was to capture pirates. The incident he refers to, he said, occurred one quiet night when he was the officer on watch. It was 3.30 in the morning when all men on board the ship became aware of a loud tapping coming from an unknown place on the vessel. This was followed by a loud, unfamiliar voice on the wind, calling the name Bill Garraway. There were then nine strikes of the ship's bell. This was unusual because, as Commander Lockyer explained, every good sailor knows that only seven tolls of the bell should have sounded. Following these strange events, Lockyer went to the wheel of the ship where he found the helmsman Bill Garraway in a state of sheer panic. His face and limbs, Lockyer said, were contorted by some overwhelming fear. The commander spoke sharply to Garraway with a view to pull him to his senses, which seemed to work. He asked him what was the matter, but Bill Garraway simply said that all was well and not to worry. He must have just fallen asleep and dreamt whilst taking his turn at the wheel. Garraway finished his watch at 4am and along with Commander Lockyer and some other members of the crew, retired for the night. When the commander awoke for breakfast a few hours later, he found that Bill Garraway had died in his bunk. It was his duty to collect the dead man's belongings. Within Garraway's box he found a scrap of paper which looked like part of a letter. The only thing legible on the scrap were the words and nine bells. Those men on board who quote had a mind for mysticism believed that Garraway had come face to face with an apparition that night who had spoken to him and in turn sent him into a paralyzing fear. Those more practically minded, like Dr. Sutcliffe, a member of the Rotary Club who was present when the story was told, believed that Garraway had suffered a mild seizure whilst on watch, and then a more severe attack which took his life during the night. A far more logical explanation, of course, but one that fails to explain the loud, unrecognisable calls of Garraway's name during the strange episode. Moving inland just slightly, we come to our next tale. This particularly unnerving story was told to famed author, broadcaster and parapsychologist Peter Underwood by a man named Hector Campbell and featured in Underwood's 1988 book, Ghosts of Dorset. There's no definite date, but it was described in 1988 as having happened some years ago, so the actual date is uncertain. Mr Campbell explained to Peter Underwood in a letter that he and his fiancée Kathleen had been walking along the seafront of Weymouth Beach in Dorset, England. It was a particularly hot summer's day, and during those months, the seafront at Weymouth is usually lined with deck chairs, often occupied by the elderly. As Hector and Kathleen passed a row of chairs, Hector picked up a horrid odour, a clear smell of decomposition. He said he looked up, and a few metres away he saw an old woman staring at him. Her glare was more than a little unfriendly. In fact, he said, the look she gave him was one of pure evil. Without drawing Kathleen's attention to the old woman, the couple carried on walking. When they reached the end of the promenade, they decided to head home. But rather than taking the quicker route past the marina of private boats, they headed back the way they came, along the seafront, as Kathleen said she wanted to take a seat and rest for a while. As they passed the same deck chairs, Hector sensed the same smell of decomposition, 
and once again reluctantly raised his eyes to meet the stare of the same old woman. This is when Kathleen stopped. She headed straight over to the seated woman, Hector said, as if completely unaware of her. He attempted to call her back and explain that the seat was taken. Kathleen protested that the chair was clearly vacant, gave him a confused look and walked towards the old woman, who now, with her arms outstretched, had her eyes clearly focused on Kathleen. A bewildered Hector Campbell watched on as his fiancée, against all laws of physics, sank into the same chair the old lady was occupying, passing straight through her and resting with a sigh of relief. This is the last thing Hector Campbell remembers before he awoke, surrounded by members of the public, a police officer and a man who said he was a doctor. Hector had fainted and was being attended to. The doctor said to him that it must have been the shock that did it. What shock, Hector thought. Had the doctor seen the old woman too? The shock of the sudden passing of the young woman you were with, said the doctor. She had died suddenly of heart failure while seated in the deck chair. Hector recalls the heartbreak he felt as he gazed at Kathleen's face, but at the same time felt that the malignant spirit of the old woman had been defeated, because, as Hector Campbell expressed in his letter to Peter Underwood, I never saw a more heavenly smile than the one on the face of my dear, dead Kathleen. Peter Underwood states in his book that this was, in fact, the third independent account he had received of a ghostly woman seen occupying the deck chairs on Weymouth Seafront. <laughs>